Good morning, church. How's everybody feeling today on this Sunday morning? How good is the Lord? Come on, someone. We had a, just an amazing time in the presence of God last night. And I just want to encourage you for those encounter nights, man, come out. Uh, I think that we finally left this place about 930. So, I mean, the spirit of God was just moving and we couldn't, we didn't want to stop. You know how when you're in this the Lord's presence, you just don't want to stop. You just want to keep going. And so that's what we were doing last night, just going after him. It was a really, really beautiful night. Uh, but if we haven't met before, my name is Adam, and it is so good to have you uh, here this morning. I just want to take a moment, though, and just celebrate uh, what God has done. So last week, we took up our Rise and Build offering. And I just want to say, man, you guys' hearts are just so generous, and your obedience blows me away. Last week... Uh, over $100,000 was given to our building fund. Yeah, come on, give God praise. Come on, that's so good. And what I believe is because your obedience and your stewardship that God takes what we've given, it's a biblical principle and he multiplies it. I believe the Lord is gonna multiply. As we do what God's called us to do, he will bless it. I believe his hand is in it. God's got this, and it's just the beginning of this process, but I know that God has a place for us that we can own and call our own, amen? amen. And so just, uh, just want to celebrate that and what God has done. We are uh, starting a new uh, series here this morning entitled, Told You So. Told You So. It might sound a little arrogant on the surface, but when God says something, it's going to come to pass, amen? amen. And so we're looking at prophetic scripture uh, throughout the Bible, that it has come to pass in those scriptures that have yet to come to pass. And so this morning we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, if you want to get your Bibles, go ahead and turn there and just put a little, uh, a little uh, placeholder uh, right there in your, in your Bible. We'll be there in a moment and we're going to read verses 13 through 15. I've entitled my message uh, here this morning, A Cursed in the Garden. Cursed in the garden. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen. You could also download the Journey Church app and find my message notes there. Uh, or if you already have the app downloaded, uh, open that up and you can find the notes um, right there on the home screen. Uh, let's pray and let's invite the Lord to speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, we thank you that God, we get to come into this place today to honor you and to worship you. And Father, we thank you for your presence that is here right now. Lord, it is such a gift, Father. And Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, God, that as we open your word, this Logos word, God, this written word, that God, it would come alive in us. It would be rhema to our heart and to our lives and to our soul. God, we need you so desperately, Jesus. And so, Lord, we come, as, as just Mike said, God, we come humbly today, God. We come with a humble and contrite heart. God, we have to have you, God. We have to, we have to hear, Lord, your voice today. So, Lord, would, as we open your word, would you speak to us, God? Would you speak to us plainly? Would, would you speak to us clearly, God? And may you just receive all the glory, honor, and the praise in which you were due. We love you so much. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. So there has been... Over the years, many prophecies that have been given. I think about, you know, Y2K, back in the day, if you remember. Uh, I remember being 16 years old, and you can do the math how old I am now. I remember being 16 years old and staying up that night when the clock was going to strike 1-1-2000 one, one, uh, and thinking to myself, okay, is everything going to go and shut off altogether? You know what I'm talking about? Like, is, is, there, they're not, is none of the electronics going to work anymore? Uh, is the bank accounts going to go to zero? I didn't have much money back then. I don't have much money today. But, you know, who's, who's to say that? And so is all that stuff is going to go and be, be gone. Like, Y2K. It, it was um, a really interesting time, and everybody's attention was captivated on that. Um, I also think about uh, the Mayan prophecy. I don't know if anyone watched the History Channel and know what I'm talking about. But they said that in 2012, I believe that the world was going to end altogether. Uh, 
those Mayans, they, uh, they were interesting people, apparently, uh, to predict that. Uh, there's been many other prophecies, planets passing by, and that, you know, you could get a, uh, a ride on a planet, just crazy stuff far out there. And, you know, our attention is so captivated. There's the lights, by the way. Our attention is just distracting for me for a second. Our attention is so captivated on what is to come. We're so captivated on what is in the future. Here's the thing about scripture. If God said it, it's going to come to pass. If God said it in his word, it is going to happen. All of these other prophecies out there, they are false prophecies. They are not in the word of God. They are not dependable. They will not happen. But we can know that if it's in the word of God, it is going to happen. God's word is true. So you might be thinking to yourself right now, Adam, why, why are we talking about this? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons. Because it shows us his love. God reveals to his people what is happening and what is to come through his word because of his love. It also shows his sovereignty and his control over humanity. That everything that, he, that happens is inside of his control. It shows us his ultimate power. It shows us that his word is true. And it should give his church, it should give us an urgency, right? An urgency to live for him and to share the gospel with those who do not know it. So our foundational scripture for uh, this message series is found in Amos, Amos 3, 7. It says this, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So God in his love for his people reveals to us what is going to happen before it happens through his word. Now prophetic people, I just want to talk to you for a moment. If you feel like you get a word from the Lord, what do you do with it? Well, the first thing you're to do is to go to scripture. Does it line up with scripture? Does that word that I feel like I'm receiving for God, does it line up with scripture? If it doesn't line up with scripture, then it's not from God. It's something that you ate or some other circumstance or something that's on your mind, right? If it doesn't line up with scripture, it is not from God. Now, if it does line up with scripture, what do you do next? You ask the Lord, Lord, what do I do with this right now? Why are you showing this to me? How do I steward it? Who do I tell? Because here's the thing about prophecy. It's subject to the prophets. Prophecy is subject to the prophets. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 13 that we know in part and we prophesy in part. And so you're asking the Lord, Lord, does it line up with Scripture because the Word and the Spirit will always agree. Does it line up with Scripture and then, Lord, what do I do with this? So this morning we're looking at the prophetic uh, passage here in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and this is a story that we're all probably very familiar with. It's a story of temptation in the garden. And what is happening here is God tells Adam, do not eat of this tree in the middle of the garden. I was talking to Bishop about this on on Friday, and he was saying, you know, the garden was just huge. And if I was Adam, I would have lived all the way down to Miami if the tree was in Jacksonville. I would have lived so far away from that because I don't want to be tempted by it. Didn't you say that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate myself from that. And so Eve, she is tempted by Satan to eat of this tree. She ends up eating of the, of the, of the tree, the knowledge of, of good and evil. Adam eats of the tree. We know the story. And then what happens? Because they ate of this tree and they sinned, they go and they hide. Doesn't sin separate us from God? But the reason why it separates us from God is it's not God, because notice God comes into the garden, he's looking for them. Who separates us from God? We do, out of our sin. But here's the thing about Jesus and what happened on the cross, is that in Romans 12 it says, now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing about the cross, is that when we inevitably we do sin, we sin in this life, what happens is that we can boldly come before Jesus because of what he'd done on the cross. We don't have to hide like Adam anymore. 
We said this a couple weeks ago, just come with a humble and contrite heart, asking the Lord, Lord, would you forgive me? It's something about rapid repentance, right? May we be people who rapidly repent when we do sin. And God is faithful and just to forgive us. Adam, what did he do? He hid because of his sin. Sin separates us. It's not God. It is us. And so God, he asked Adam these questions, where are you at? And he goes, I'm hiding because I'm afraid. And then God asked him two questions. He asked him, um, did you eat of the tree and how did you know that you were naked? He asked him those questions and Adam immediately responds to God by saying, it's Eve's fault. <laughs> Man, let me just give you two cents here. Uh, don't blame it on your wife, okay? Adam was in the doghouse from that point forward. I don't know what that man was thinking. I mean, come on, man. You know what I'm saying? You guys know what I'm talking about, the reference. Come on, man. Come on, man. I love the old ESPN tag that used to be back in the day. And so he blames him. What is he thinking? And then we pick it up right here in verse 13. And this is God curses Satan. He curses Eve and he curses Adam. And this is what we see in Scripture. Verse 13, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast in the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, enmity meaning hostility or hatred, uh, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So God says to Satan three things. And when God says it, what's going to happen? It's going to come to pass. So interestingly enough, here in Genesis 3.15, this is called a messianic prophecy. A messianic prophecy. The word messianic comes from Messiah. Messiah means to deliver or a king who will be sent by God. Of course, we know that is Jesus. Let me give you a definition of messianic prophecy. It means this, all prophecy that refers to the coming of Christ, to his work of salvation, or to the growth and consummation of his kingdom. I'm going to read that one more time. All prophecy, messianic prophecy is all prophecy that refers to the coming of Christ, to his work of salvation, or to the growth and consummation of his kingdom. So there are 300 messianic prophecies that we see in the Old Testament. Over 300 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And so this is the first time that we see the need of a Savior. Right here in this moment, Adam falls, he sins, and what does God do? He immediately puts into action a rescue plan for us. Why? Because he wants relationship with us again. He knows in that moment that now sin has separated, but now he wants to send his son so that now we can have a relationship with him. And so let's look at this, uh, this, this first prophecy. By the way, this is one prophecy, three different parts. One prophecy, three different parts. The, the three different parts are the conflict between humanity and Satan, We see Satan will bruise the heel of Christ, and Christ will bruise the head of Satan. So let's look at number one. Number one, the first prophecy we see here in Genesis 3, the first part of this prophecy, the messianic prophecy, is this. There will be conflict between humanity and Satan. There will be conflict between humanity and Satan. This was fulfilled pretty much instantly right there in the garden. Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity, hostility, or hatred between you and the woman in between your seed and her seed. So not only Satan and Eve will be there be conflict, but also humanity and demonic principalities and powers of darkness will there be conflict. So in this battle, this is what is happening, I believe, and we can see it, it's on an increased level today, isn't it? In Isaiah 520, it says this, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Listen, the the moral code has been rewritten in our time, in our society today. People no longer feel guilty when they stop doing what was once considered right. 
personal taste and opinion now rule supreme over everything else. Sadly, there is now a celebration of homosexuality. There's a celebration in the defense of abortion on demand. Evil is being called good, and good is being slandered as evil. Apart from God, our value system will always become unclear. We will begin to confuse sweetness and bitterness, light and darkness, and good and evil. Sadly today, culture has begun to label biblical morality as intolerant and oppressive. We are in a battle against Satan, church. This battle is the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And as followers of Christ, we are not passive spectators just hoping everything pans out as okay in this world. We are active participants in a spiritual battle that has been going on since this moment in Genesis chapter 3. In the Bible, it often describes this struggle that is happening and going on today. Describing it as a cosmic conflict between the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, God and Satan. Ephesians 6.12, it says this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness, wickedness in heavenly places. Listen, our true enemies are not people. Our true enemy is not people, but the spiritual forces that seek to oppose God's plan and hinder his kingdom from advancing. Your enemy is not someone who did you wrong. Your enemy is not that family member who's done something to you. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not someone else. Your enemy is not Donald Trump or Joe Biden, whichever side of the political spectrum you're on. Your enemy is not that. Your enemy is the kingdom of darkness. And as we're fighting this battle, we got to know that because out of God's love, he's given us every tool to overcome the kingdom of darkness. The spirit of God, he lives within us. If the spirit of God lives in us, greater he is in the world than he, greater is he that's within us than he is within the world. He's given us every tool. So what do we do? We got to spend every single day in the word of God. Without the word of God being the lamp into our feet and the light into our path, because it is a lamp into our feet and a light to our path. We'll go to the left and to the right. We've got to know the word of God. We've got to be in the word of God. May we be people of his word, who study his word, who knows what it says, and who live what the word of God says. That we would be people of intercession and prayer. We've got to know, man, our prayer, it works. When we pray, God answers our prayer. When we come together and we intercede on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings, God hears our prayer and he answers it. But we've also got to know that in this life, man, daily, 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 we've got to put on the full armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. We've got to know what's true and what's not. The feet of peace so we don't have anxiety in the things of this world that hold us down. The helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit to cut down everything that the enemy is coming against us and the shield of faith. God has given us every tool for this cosmic battle in which we are in. Make no mistake about it, the enemy does not like you. He does not like you one bit. It all started right here in the garden. There's a hatred that he has towards you. There's a jealousy that he has towards you because God loves you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Receive that this morning. God loves you. And so right here in the garden, we see this first thing. There's going to be conflict between humanity and the powers of darkness. The second prophetic thing that we see in this passage, in this scripture, is Satan will bruise the heel of Christ. Satan will bruise the heel of Christ. Genesis 3.15, and you shall bruise his heel. This has been fulfilled and refers to the crucifixion of Christ. The word bruise in Hebrew could also mean crushed or to come down on. And so if that's true, then you could say this, that Satan will crush the heel of Christ. Now, when a heel is crushed, it hurts. It hurts, but it's, a heel is very resilient. It will heal. It may give you a limp for three days, you get what I'm getting at? It may give you a limp for three days. So I like to think about this passage like this. Satan gave Jesus just a limp for three days. It's like Satan wants to be Jesus. He's an imitator of things. 
He tries to imitate what is good and make it his own. And so he's allowed, God in his sovereignty has allowed him to follow behind him. And he got so close to Jesus that he was allowed to step on his heel. But what did Jesus keep on doing? It's just like, when I think of it like this. When I'm hiking with my kids and they accidentally step on the back of my heel, what happens? It might hurt a little bit. What do I do? I just keep on walking. When, when Satan, he stepped on the heel of Jesus, what happened? Jesus just kept on walking in redeeming humanity. He overcame death, hell, and the graves so that we could have relationship with him. He conquered death. And here's the thing about it is Satan, he thought for a moment that he won. Look at this in Hebrews, Hebrews 2.14. That through death he, he being Jesus, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Let me read that more time. That through death he, he is Jesus, might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Here in Hebrews it says that Satan has gained power over death. For three days Satan thought he had the power over death. But he didn't have the ultimate power over death. He thought that he had the power. He thought that he won. It's almost like Satan just keeps on coming back, keeps on coming back time and time again, but he just can't win. He can't win. He's that person who just keeps coming back, keeps getting beat up. He cannot win. Jesus is the ultimate conqueror, and he will once and for all defeat Satan. Listen, at the cross, that is what happened. Christ defeated death at the cross and will ultimately defeat him once and for all. I wrote this down. Satan is annoyed that he's only an annoyance. <laughs> when you step on the back of someone's heels, it's just a little bit of annoyance. But look at this. Christ will bruise the head of Satan. That's something to cheer about. Christ will bruise the head of Satan. It's coming. It already has begun. Look at this. Verse, uh, verse 15, he shall bruise your head. This started at the resurrection and will be complete at the end of this age. This started at the resurrection, the crushing of the head of Satan, and will be complete at the end of this age. I said earlier the bruise in Hebrew could also mean crushed or to come down on. So when a heel is crushed, it's very resilient. It will heal. But what happens when a head is crushed? It is ultimate and complete defeat. Christ will crush the head of Satan. Look at this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says this, And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent, that ancient serpent is a reference all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. This is what's going to happen. And his angels were thrown down with him. And John sees this. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Here's further proof if you need it. That Satan is a deceiver. He is a father of lies. He will try to tell you that you can find fulfillment and success in this life. He will try to tell you that sex brings lasting pleasure or that money offers security, but it does not. He is trying to lie to his people and he's trying to deceive you. Do not be deceived, church. The devil is the father of lies. And Jesus says, and we see this picture that John has, that he will go into everlasting fire. It says that's prepared for the devil and his angels and for those who have also not surrendered their life to Christ. Matthew 25, 41, it says this, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Listen, the devil's punishment which is hell, is part of God's eternal plan. It's being prepared for him. The scheming, deceiving enemy finds his eternal dwelling in the lake of fire. What is hell? What is hell? Some people say hell is a condition of suffering in this life. But this is not how the Bible describes it. 
Jesus told a story about a rich man who died and he went to hell. This man is consciously aware of his suffering. This man, this rich man that Jesus told the story of is consciously aware of his suffering. This man cries out in Luke 16, 24, I am in anguish in this flame. I'm in anguish in this flame. Listen, hell is a real place that awaits those who do not surrender to Jesus. It's a real place reserved for Satan, reserved for demonic principalities, and for those who do not surrender their life to Jesus. It's a place in which they will spend eternity. And so the thing is, this concept of unending suffering in the lake of fire does not meet some people's understanding of God's character because we think, okay, God is love, and so how could a God of love allow anyone to go to hell? Here's the thing about love, first off. He can't force you to love him. He gives you a choice. If you wonder why things are happening in the world that's messed up and just crazy, it's because God has given us free will to choose to love him. And in choosing to love him, we either choose to love him or the things of this world. I think of it like this, my, my daughter when she was young, she uh, had an Elmo that when you uh, pushed, pushed his hand, it would say, Elmo loves you. Elmo loves you. Did that doll love my daughter? No, it did not love my daughter. Is that doll even still around today? She's 13 years old now? Nope, it's not around today. If that doll actually loved my daughter, and my daughter actually loved that doll, that doll is to be around today. That doll is not around today. God gives us choice in his love to choose him or to not choose him. And in his love as well, there's this tension because why would the God of love allow hell to happen? God is also a God of justice, a God of righteousness, a God of holiness. A God of justice, a God of righteousness, and a God of holiness. And that has every, those characteristics have every bit to do with eternity as his love. His desire is not that one single person would perish, but all will come to eternal life. I mean, God, think about this. God sent his only son for us, his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He does not want anyone to go to hell. He wants us to turn our hearts to him. It's a very real place. And Satan is trying to drag and bring everyone he possibly can with him because he hates you. So we have a choice to make. Are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to follow after the things of this world that the enemy is trying to tell you that will fulfill your life? Would you rise with me in this room? With every head bowed and every eye closed in this moment, prayer team, you can come forward. Is there anyone in this room?